Hello everybody and welcome back to another edition of Ring Respect Radio right here on the Video Bros Network. My name is Bobby Munson and I'm joined as always by my co-host. He is the man with the angelic voice. You know him as Papa Smokes. How you doing, sir? I'm doing great, Munson. How are all you wrestling people doing out there? Hopefully everybody's doing wonderful and we look forward to seeing you again in some sort of live capacity here in the upcoming months. Uh, not sure when that's going to be, Papa Smokes, but we definitely are looking forward to the day we can get back to some live wrestling action. Well, we know that uh, wrestling action is taking place all over the world and in front of audiences. We know that that's uh, become a big thing, and it's great to see live wrestling action taking place that we can look back on and review and everything like that. Uh, before we get into today's show, I'm going to ask you, as always, to go ahead and click the subscribe button down below. I know that a lot of you tuning in are not yet subscribed. I know it takes just one moment out of your day, and what it does for us is actually helps to rank our videos up through the Google searches and everything like that so we can reach a larger audience. Speaking of larger audiences, Papa Smokes, I've uh, started doing a little bit of work over with my friends at Love Wrestling there. I joined them on Sunday brunch this weekend, and we were able to give a shout-out to Ring Respect Radio over on Love Wrestling. So I want to thank Spencer Love and all the great people over at Love Wrestling for not only uh, having me over there working with them too, but also supporting Ring Respect Radio and being supporters of Prairie Pro Wrestling, who also got a big shout-out on the show as well too. So thank you very much, Love Wrestling, for all you do for us. And I couldn't... Uh, Give out a shout out to them without giving a shout out to Backbreaker Media who have done great things for us. So you can catch our show on all of their podcast channels. And also you can re-catch uh, episodes of Ring Respect Radio through the Canadian Wrestling Network as well. So a lot of great ways that we've been expanding out over this pandemic. Papa Smokes reaching a larger audience. Uh, getting our name out there. It's been fantastic. Uh, the only thing I think we're missing out of this is getting back to our good old commentary days. Uh, that's one thing I am missing here. How about yourself? Yeah, I also miss getting on the mic and calling some uh, matches in the with the live action and everything else, but uh, we'll get back to it when this COVID situation calms down and uh, we can get some uh, bigger crowds without risk to everybody. We'll be back. Don't you worry about that. Looking forward to it, Dan. In the meantime, there's been a lot going on in the wrestling world uh, as it is. A lot of big events coming up. I know that uh, WWE run in SummerSlam coming up uh, this weekend as we're recording this on a Tuesday. I know that uh, NWA 73 coming up, uh, NWA Empower, the all-female NWA uh, event is coming up there that's being run by Mickey James, which is a very interesting thing for the NWA as well too. So lots of big things coming up, a lot of great topics, uh, a lot of things that maybe not so much are going to be brought up on this show, but we got a lot to talk about. And uh, one of the things we are going to talk about is the life and career of one Bobby Eaton who passed away just recently. We'll get into that very shortly here too. <laughs> But the other big thing we've been teasing for quite some time here on the show is talking about a legend, uh, probably one of the biggest legends in professional wrestling. We're talking about Andre the Giant, the eighth wonder of the world. We're going to be doing a book review. We both had the opportunity to read the book, The Eighth Wonder of the World, The True Story of Andre the Giant. And pardon me if I don't get these names right, but I believe the guys who authored this book were Bertrand he uh, Hebert, and Pat Prade. I hope I got my pronunciation correctly. I am uh, not too up on my uh, French speaking, so pardon my lack of uh, knowledge on the uh, French language there if I got your names wrong, guys, and you happen to be listening in here today. So we're going to be going over that, and we'll get into that a little bit in depth. I know that that all kind of stemmed from uh, my lack of knowledge of Andre the Giant, especially pre-1990s Andre the Giant, at least anyway. And wow, what a uh, can of worms we... Opened up by checking back on the career of this gentleman. It's uh, it's going to be quite the show. So uh, before we go on any further, again, we uh, want to thank you for tuning in today. And we start on a sad note, as we have done many times here on Ring Respect uh, Radio. We're talking about Bobby Eaton. And this one kind of hit hard for a lot of people. Um, I know this one would have hit close uh, to home for yourself, Pop Smokes. I know I've been uh, checking out a lot of Bobby Eaton's work a lot lately. And, of course, I was familiar. I'd seen him back in the 90s working with WCW and stuff like that, too. So did have the opportunity to get to see Bobby Eaton do his work, work his magic. Probably one of the best in-ring performers possibly ever in the history of professional wrestling. We're going to talk about why. Um, before we even get started on his career, I just want to mention it's, it's going to be hard for us to do the same kind of justice that people who knew him on a personal level do. And I'm going to say it right here, right now. We don't often bring up the name Jim Cornette on this show because a lot of the times 
a lot of you out there listening get very offended by the things Jim Cornette speaks about when it comes to modern wrestling. But there's no doubt in our minds or anyone's minds, Jim Cornette, a brilliant, brilliant wrestling mind and a brilliant re- wrestling manager who worked with Bobby Eaton. Uh, if you have a chance, whether you like his show or not, at least go check out Jim Cornette's tribute to Bobby Eaton. It was, I would say, a very hard listen in many ways. Uh, Jim, very, very heartbroken by the passing of Bobby Eaton, had a lot of trouble even putting the show out and stuff like that. But if you want to go and hear somebody who knew the guy on a personal level, spent many years with him and can give you the real in and outs of the career of Bobby Eaton, we're going to recommend this one time that you put all your differences aside and go listen to Jim Cornette's experience and uh, his talk about Bobby Eaton. So definitely go give that one a listen, whether you like Jim Cornette or not. I think you won't be disappointed. Uh, Your thoughts on that, Bob Smokes? Yeah, I think it's a good recommendation. It was a tough listen. I wanted to hear what Jim had to say about his close friend, Bobby Eaton, and a co-worker in the wrestling business for so long. Really heartbreaking to hear. And then just the uh, the emotional uh, outpouring online for uh, the love of Bobby Eaton by many, many uh, current and, and young wrestlers as well just shows how much his work was valued and how much it's uh, studied by young wrestlers today. There was even a particular young wrestler that we had spoken to, we won't drop names here in particular, but uh, who also mentioned about him studying the tapes of Bobby Eaton and looking up to him. And, you know, it, it threw us to hear such a young guy mention Bobby Eaton in that vein and that he was watching and studying his work. But it goes to show in this, uh, this guy's work in the ring and stuff like that just how well he has adapted to being that style of wrestler, knowing how to sell it properly in the ring knowing what kind of facials to deliver and knowing the the right holds to do at the right times and stuff. Something that Bobby Eaton was an absolute master at and some of these young guys are taken to that. And it's great to see that that kind of tradition can live on in some of the youth in professional wrestling. Indeed. And I th- you hear it a lot nowadays from young wrestlers that, that don't have that reverence for the past that say that the, the business has changed and that it's different now and that you can't train like an old wrestler. I think... Uh, this current uh, uh, love for Bobby Eaton uh, uh, after his passing has just showed that that, that isn't true at all, that, that you can still train as the uh, uh, previous generation's wrestlers train and still have great success because the fundamentals remain the same. Uh, there's always trends and, and, uh, and fashions that go through wrestling, such as we're kind of in a high-flying uh, aerial maneuver kind of trend right now in wrestling, but... It won't be forever. Uh, always the uh, the fundamentals, the basics are going to be so, so important to, to uh, new wrestlers entering the business that, yeah, you should go back and study Bobby Eaton, Harley Race, and the other classic wrestlers of the previous generation. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the career of Bobby Eaton as well, too. And you could probably shed a lot more light on the stuff that I've got written down here, Papa Smokes, but... Bobby Eaton started wrestling, made his debut, in fact, at the age of 17, I believe it was NWA Mid-America, that he was working for uh, Nick Goulas and uh, Roy Welch, if I'm not mistaken. That was yeah. the Tennessee, Kentucky, and Alabama era, area, sorry, and uh, that's where he worked um, and was probably elevated by a feud there with a team known as the Hollywood Blondes, Jerry Brown and Buddy Roberts, that really kind of pushed Bobby up the ladder over there in NWA Mid-America. Uh, can you may elaborate a little bit more on that you might know a little bit more on that one yeah i just uh bobby came up in in southern wrestling uh, as you said in the in the kentucky and alabama area and uh that's um a lot of people don't remember a lot of the stars and and just uh, uh other wrestlers from that time but when you come up in uh southern wrestling in the 70s and 80s you're getting a good at wrestling education these all these promoters and all the veteran wrestlers took the business very, very seriously. And uh, you just weren't going to be let in unless you looked like you were going to be a, a proper wrestler, uh, uh, adhering to the proper uh, rules in wrestling, uh, according to kayfabe and, and some other things as well. And uh, he, he was just uh, like a sponge getting a, an education from these old Southern guys that had spent their whole lives wrestling and uh, and trained the new guys in the right way in order to uh, in order to be able to make money in the wrestling business. Yeah, and then uh, I also have written down there that his first title win that he received while he was there uh, was when he was teaming up with Leap and Lanny Pofo, a name that I'm sure many of our le- uh, our listeners might not necessarily know, but uh, 
If any of you are fans of, say, WWF in the 90s, might remember the genius. Might be the yeah. easiest way to explain who that is. Or we could go ahead and say the uh, brother to one macho man, Randy Savage, as well, too, might help them out a little bit. But a tag team, they won the NWA Mid-America Tag Team Championship together. That was his first title win. But... Bobby also been in lots of different tag teams. He also was in a tag team there in NWA Mid-America known as the Jet Set Tag Team with George Goulas, who was the son of Nick Goulas, and that was uh, as part of uh, pumping George Goulas up the uh, ladder as well, too, by his uh, by his father, Nick. Most definitely, and the, the story of George Goulas is kind of a funny one if you think about it. Uh, he was a, a big guy and an athletic-looking guy, but he was the shits at wrestling, and he never really... Um, took it seriously enough to train really hard, but his dad was the promoter, so he got he got any spot that he wanted, and his dad pushed him hard to be a top baby face in the area, and the, the guy couldn't get it right to save his life sort of thing, so uh, that that's certainly an indication of Bobby being a guy starting out and uh, having to go with uh, in a tag team with the promoter's son, but just another little funny footnote in his history for sure. Yeah, and then... Uh... After the NWA Mid-America, I believe that he went to work for Jerry Jarrett for a little while, a short little while in Continental Wrestling Association. Uh, once again, being put into a tag team situation where he was teamed up with Sweet Brown Sugar. And him and Sweet Brown Sugar often found themselves uh, up against a familiar face to uh, Bobby Eaton. That would be Stan Lane. He found himself on the opposite side of the ring to somebody who would inevitably be, be a lifelong friend to Bobby Eaton. Yeah, yeah, and in these early days, Stan Lane at that point was still in the uh, the tag team with Steve Kern, known as the Fabulous Ones, and they had been brought in by Fabulous Jackie Fargo, who wanted to who wanted a team that represented his uh, worldview and such, and uh, they th- thus the Fabulous Ones were born. You know, to coming to the ring, good looking guys with the uh, uh, Chippendales little bow ties and the and the little suspenders on, and they were. They were a team for the girls to like, and it definitely worked, and uh, they got crowds of uh, adoring female fans, but they, they were good workers as well. Uh, I saw the Fabulous Ones uh, live in, in the old AWA days in Winnipeg a number of times, and they, they were they were a lot like uh, the babyface teams that came after them, such as the Rock and Roll Express and the and uh, that, that type of uh, babyface team that's popular with the girls, and... Uh, that would have been a a a, a pretty uh, a pretty good meeting for these guys at this time to get to know each other to think yeah you know like uh, we liked our match with you we liked your style maybe we'll work together in the future at some point and of course many years later they did yeah and then after that uh, it was about 1983 I believe that Bobby Eaton found himself heading over to Mid South Wrestling this would be where I believe his teaming up with Jim Cornette finally took place Jim Cornette becoming the manager of what would become known as the Midnight Express, uh, originally teaming up with Dennis Condry. And this would be where he was dubbed the name uh, Beautiful Bobby Eaton. And this was to go along with the name uh, Dennis Condry had going as well, too. I believe that is where that stems from, if I'm not mistaken, Pop. As well. Yeah, Dennis Condry was the lover boy and, <laughs> and Beautiful Bobby, and, which is also kind of a little rib, too, because neither of the guys particularly handsome or anything like that. It was it was a shot at the fans and a shot at, at the babyface tag teams, and it worked like a charm. Oh, so what you're telling me is that when they were calling me Beautiful Bobby on Love Wrestling the other day, they were taking the piss out of me. I'm going to have to talk to the boys about that one. <laughs> and that would start the Midnight Express, which would go on to be probably what Bobby Eaton is most well known for, is the tag team, the Midnight Express, many great title runs that he had there as well, too. Uh, many great feuds that they have with the team that you brought up, the Rock and Roll Express, probably the most notorious tag team feud in possibly wrestling history. Yeah, yeah, they 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 had a license to print money with those two teams going at it. And just to back up slightly, at the beginning of the, the Midnight Express, they, this was a good thing too because Bobby was had a few years in the business but was more or less just starting out. Cornette was young, was 20 or 21 years old, but they wanted him as a manager because he had that smart mouth. And uh, then when they got Dennis, that was the guy that he was the veteran already. You know, Dennis, even in his 20s, he looked like he was in his 50s kind of thing. He's he's the classic grizzled veteran. And 
I think uh, when those guys started traveling together and uh, doing matches and setting up matches and meeting opponents and all that, Dennis was truly the guy that, that taught the other two all about the business, all about the ring psychology, all about uh, payoffs and how to deal with promoters and, and how to get over uh, on other teams and stuff like that. So Dennis, a huge, huge part of the Midnight Express, only there for the, the first half of their run kind of thing. But uh, yeah, I think it was him that taught the other two guys quite uh, pretty much everything about the business. Yeah. Uh, Jim Crockett promotion slash WCW was another location for Bobby Eaton. This is where he kind of headed to the uh, singles competition more so. And even I, I went back and watched a match from his WCW Jim Crockett promotion time. Ric Flair defending the WCW championship at the time against Bobby Eaton. That was a hell of a match too. I mean, these two paired up extremely well together. Uh, and you can really, if you go to YouTube, I'll see if I can put the link here in this video for you guys. Uh, go and check this match out in particular, because not only are both competitors great at what they do, but just pay close attention to how Bobby Eaton sells this matchup. It is 90% all in what this guy does that makes this match as exciting as it is. Despite the great quality that Ric Flair delivers to the table, Bobby Eaton carried this thing and made Flair look like the champion that he is, while not underselling himself and still making himself look like a top contender for that WCW championship. Excellent match. I loved every minute of it. I don't know if you've seen that one in particular, Papa Smokes. Yeah, I have seen it. That That is a famous WCW match for sure. And it's a match that Flair asked for too. It's kind of funny because Bobby didn't have a reputation as a singles superstar at that time or, or didn't have a great singles background on him. But uh, when the uh, when uh, uh, TNT management, uh, uh, the Turner Network wanted... Uh, more and better challengers for Ric Flair's title. They asked him who he wanted to fight, and Rick immediately said, I would prefer Bobby Eaton over anybody because he's the best worker we've got in this company aside from me. So uh, high praise from Ric Flair there, and uh, and Bobby made the best of his chance. Yeah, and Bobby did uh, travel worldwide as well too. Again, I've got marked down that he did do some work for New Japan Pro Wrestling back in the the 90s and stuff there too so there's an opportunity for him there i uh, want to touch a little, little bit on smoky mountain wrestling because we talked about jim cornett and again we're going to bring him up smoky mountain wrestling jim cornett's promotion that uh, bobby eaton went over to in the 90s there and had uh, quite a successful time over there working with jim cornett and smoky mountain wrestling as well too yeah you knew that uh, cornett was going to be using some of his friends and, and he had a lot of great and influential friends in the business, including we've talked about Bob Armstrong and Tracy Smothers and a few of the other guys before. Unfortunately, we've been talking about them in obituary style uh, conversations as well. But here's another one, Bobby Eaton, that came to uh, Smoky Mountain Wrestling. He's versatile. He could do whatever he wanted. He was uh, friendly with Cornette and the other guys. And uh, yeah, you, you couldn't hope to get a better uh, wrestler in your promotion than Bobby Eaton. So as his career went on, there was a couple of like uh, last things that uh, Bobby Eaton left behind in the ring. Uh, he did make an appearance for TNA Impact uh, back in the 2000s. Uh, his last appearance there being with uh, Kid Cash in particular. And then uh, he did kind of like a series of finale tag matches, uh, the Midnight Express and the Rock and Roll Express, which inevitably led to the 2015 match that he had with Ricky Morton, which would go down as his last official match in a professional wrestling ring as well, too. Yeah, yeah, uh, great stuff. But, uh, in you know, everyone will remember Eaton from the Midnight Express. And, and I've heard it said or written online that maybe at the Midnight Express wasn't one of the great tag teams of all time because they... They had some belts and stuff, but they never uh, accomplished stuff in the WWE or they never did this or they never did that. But the, I, I still firmly believe, and I think it's thought of by a lot of wrestling historians, that the greatness of the Midnight Express was not that they were the most dominant tag team. They weren't the Road Warriors or they weren't the Steiners, you know, rolling over opponents and crushing them, but they were extremely versatile so they could work with any team and make any team look good, regardless of the uh, amount exp of experience that that team had. So they could main event uh, big shows like the like the Crockett Cup and uh, and uh, various things for uh, NWA and WCW. But they could also 
make a job team look good if they had to. And they were just entirely versatile. And with the the great experience and ability of uh, Condry and Eaton and also Lane and Eaton and the knowledge of Cornette, who, who was quickly, quickly learning all this, all the intricacies of the professional wrestling world and ring psychology. Yeah, they were just the versatility. And that's what the company loved about them was that any team we have that we need to bring up, get over, uh, introduce, uh, uh, anything like that, get them to have, give them a match with the Midnight Express and they will make that team look excellent. Uh, whether it's a win, whether it's a loss, they will sell the shit out of the match. They will put your, their opponents over if that's necessary in, in a massive way. And they, yeah, all that was just money, money, money constantly for uh, whatever promoters they worked for. Now, you mentioned about uh, a lot of people being critical that they never really made it big in the WWF or anything like that. <clears throat> and, you know, it kind of makes me look back on my own uh, reflection as a wrestling fan. Uh, we talked about it before. I, when I grew up, it was late 80s, early 90s. I started getting into it. And back then, and all through the 90s even for that matter, I would have had believed that being in the WWF and making it there was the be-all and end-all of the wrestling world because it's all I had perceived of wrestling. I guess I had a very narrow scope that I had growing up. It's not until more recently, especially in the last few years, especially doing the show with you, Pop Smokes, that I've had that opportunity to go back, look on the things that I didn't know and adventure into these things and start to realize that that isn't the be-all and end-all. These guys drew some bigger gates than what guys in the WWF ever did. Their title runs were a lot more prestigious than what some of the ones in WWF were. And them not signing with Vince McMahon and being made into these cartoon characters makes me believe that there was a lot of integrity that these guys had about their own professional wrestling that they didn't want to go and have that be what they ended up known for, being a, a joke team on Vince McMahon's WWF Superstars of Wrestling or something along those lines. So... I kind of have to commend Bobby Eaton and the Midnight Express for never really going down that path or, you know, feeling the, that that was necessary to ever, you know, cement their names in the world of professional wrestling. I think they did enough on their own and a fantastic career that he had. Um, one more thing I want to bring up is, uh, you know, I was telling the story of Bobby Eaton to my wife recently. Uh, she's unfamiliar with who he is, so I was doing a little bit of a conversation. I said, you know... Hollywood couldn't ask for a better life story or some biography company, an A&E biography, couldn't ask for a better life story than Bobby Eaton's entire career right up until his passing. Especially when you think about how the heartbreaking tragedy of he just lost his wife one month prior. Like you talk, you talk about Hollywood always talking about somebody dying of a broken heart. Well, Bobby Eaton passed away one month after his wife's passing. You can sincerely say that that was somebody dying of a broken heart there, Papa Smokes. Yeah, yeah, that that is so sad, and and when you look back on on who she was, it makes it even more interesting because Bobby met her when he was, he was twenty one or something, and she was eighteen or, or or when they were very young anyway, and she was the she was his Booker's daughter, she was Bill Dundee's daughter, and Bill Dundee, a real life tough guy and all that, he uh. He had told his daughter and all the boys in the locker room, don't you ever go near her. I don't want her dating a wrestler. She'll never date a wrestler. And uh, he had warned her about that. And then finally she she had started seeing a wrestler and she admitted it to her dad. And he said, who is it? I'm going to kill him. He'll never work in this business again. And she said, it's Bobby Eaton. And Dundee was kind of dumbstruck and said, well, Okay, at least you picked the one guy that I'm not going to do that to. And that, that's that's indicative of Bobby's whole life. He was a nice guy and everybody liked him. And nobody has anything bad to say about him. So that makes what, a conversation like this even more sad. A very popular and, and nice guy that never did bad by anybody. And I also heard uh, stories from some of the podcasts and everything that I've listened to over the last little bit. That he was the kind of guy that would make sure that he had additional toiletries with him when he was on the road. Not necessarily for himself, but because he knew some guy would forget a toothbrush. Some guy would get a roll of uh, shit tickets that he didn't have with him or something like that. And there was uh, Bobby Eaton to save the day every single time. He was always looking out for the boys, always looking out for his friends and family. Uh, just one hell of a dude. Uh, after listening to these podcasts and doing this, I immediately knew not only did we have to take the time to talk about him here on the show, Papa Smokes, but I knew this one was going to be 
not an easy one to do and not an easy one to do justice to. Like we mentioned, um, there's so many great podcasts out there that you can go listen to of guys that worked with Bobby, knew him personally, and uh, very heartbreaking to listen to. And I hope that uh, in talking about him today, we've hopefully done a little bit of uh, justice to him. And I hope that any of you that might have tuned in to us and haven't tuned into the other podcasts, not only will take your time to go listen to the other podcasts, but take your time, spend a few days or a few weeks even, and just go over the tapes and matches of Bobby Eaton. You will be treated to one of the best professional wrestlers that you could possibly see. Um, that's all I had written down personally, Papa Smokes. I'll turn it back over to you to see if you have anything else you wanted to add in talking about Bobby Eaton before we move on. Yeah, I don't have anything much more new to add, but a, a nice conversation about a great wrestler and uh We'll miss him, and that's the bottom line with that. Uh, we'll miss Bobby Eaton, and, and I, I just have confidence that he's left his mark on future performers, uh, such as some of the young guys we've brought up that study his work, and, and will try to do justice to that. Perfect. Well, from there, we're talking about another legend of the uh, ring as well, too. Uh, one that we lost a long time ago, but we haven't had an opportunity to really speak about in depth here on Ring Respect Radio. And one that we've been wanting to do for quite a while. And I'm going to go ahead and just tell a little bit of the backstory about where the conversation to this one led and what led us to talking about Andre the Giant here today. So in starting Ring Respect uh, Radio, doing this podcast the way we have been doing it, I got to talk to you about more wrestlers, about the past and stuff like that. Things that I wasn't uh, privy to as a kid. And my knowledge of Andre the Giant stemmed from the 90s, the late 80s, even WWF stuff. His work with Hulk Hogan, uh, maybe his run as the tag champ with Haku and, you know, WrestleMania 6 when he lost out to Demolition right before the end of his career. I never got to see Andre the Giant the wrestler. I was always seeing Andre the Giant the spectacle. And I remember making a comment about Andre being a spectacle, but not a good wrestler. And immediately... You corrected me and said that Andre the Giant pre-WWF back in the day was known as one of the great grapplers of the ring. And to this, I needed to do more research. And that's where we kind of got led to, Pop Smokes. We know that the book, The Eighth Wonder of the World, The True Story of Andre the Giant by Bertrand Hebert and Pat Laprade came out. We knew that we were going to have to read this one. We had heard some things about it from other podcasts and everything like that. And... We're going to go a little bit, in, uh, well, quite a bit in depth on this one and talking about Andre the Giant here as well. I'm, first of all, I'm going to say commend the two guys that wrote this thing because this thing is a masterpiece when it comes to books about professional wrestling. I've, I've only read a handful. I think you've probably sat down and read a lot more wrestling books than I have, Papa Smokes, and you can elaborate a little bit on that. But this one for me stands out as probably one of the best pieces of literature I've read about professional wrestling so far. Yeah, I have to agree with that, and and I've gone through some books. You know my uh, my love for wrestling history, and and there's been some great books written, but th this is definitely one of them uh, among the top uh, wrestling biographies that I've read. And uh, I think uh, Eber and Laprade did such a great job on this, and uh, it it comes across as a, a nice biography of of Andre's life, but it's also uh, uh, to my liking, it's quite wrestling heavy as well. It goes into some uh, a lot of details about competing promotions and uh, the way that wrestling was booked and the way that uh, stars were booked in different cities and different countries. And I, th this is like catnip for me. I, I, I soak it up. I love it and uh, can't commend the guys more for uh, the writing of a great book. Th this will be the standard uh, book on Andre in the future, I'm quite sure. And you know that you're off to a good read when the Ford is started off by a guy like Stan Hansen. Stan Hansen writing the Ford for Andre the Giant and writing that it was an absolute honor for him to be able to write this uh, Ford by Andre. Um, in reading this book, and we'll get more into it right away, there's a lot of mixed things when it comes to Andre. A lot of guys out there that you'll hear talking about not liking working with Andre and then other guys who thought he was the absolute best guy to work with in the professional wrestling ring. It seemed to me in reading this book that I got the impression that you either got along with Andre the Giant and he loved the hell out of you and would look out for you every step of the way, or you were somebody that just was of no interest to him, he had no use for you, you for whatever reason you ticked him off, or whatever it was, and Andre was just not willing to work with you. Or he, 
some guys were just flat out annoying to him <laughs> and he would he would let them know it yeah i think that's a big part of andre is that he was uh, married to the business and and the shows and hanging out with the boys in the back uh locker rooms and such was andre's life and he guarded it very uh very fiercely and if he felt like you weren't acting right in the dressing room or if he did if you said things that he didn't like or if it was contrary to some sense of kayfabe back then Andre just probably wasn't going to like you and probably not going to work with you if he if he kept running into you in the in the locker rooms and he realized you were a good wrestler he might light up lighten up after that but uh yeah, Andre was a wrestler's wrestler, and uh, if he didn't think you fit in with the whole program, he, he wasn't going to pretend that he liked you. Yeah, so born Andre Rusimov. I don't know if it, uh, everybody listening in will definitely know that he was Andre Rusimov by birth. Uh, later would become Andre the Giant. That was more of a uh, Vince McMahon Sr. dubbed thing, and for promoting that we'll get into in a little bit here. Um, but yeah, I mean, this guy started off I guess, training in France, where he was originally from. Uh, took his training with some really great grapplers in the ring and had some excellent matches. Uh, one in particular that I want to talk about just for a minute here uh, before we go into some more depth. I had sent you a YouTube video, and if anyone wants to check it out, against a gentleman named Franz Boyton, I believe is the name pronounced that way. Uh, this was from the 1960s. It is in black and white, but this one really is what got me to see Andre the Giant the Grappler at this point. This, I mean, he was extremely tall, extremely fit, young guy, looked great, and man, could he grapple. And this is what really changed my mind. The book was one thing, but watching that match in particular really opened my eyes to what Andre was capable of and what, it backed up everything that's inside this book as well, Papa Smokes, all the talk about his matchups, his great feuds that he had, the great grappling that he had, and what made him that spectacle in the first place. It wasn't just the sheer size of this guy it was the fact that he was the size he was but he also could grapple with the absolute best grapplers in the professional wrestling world yeah yeah and it's it's worth noting too that in the early 70s when he was getting trained in paris number one he wasn't as big as he would eventually get because he had that pituitary gland uh, issue so he kept growing his whole life so when he first started wrestling at age 18 or 20 he was big, but not as big as he would eventually become. So he was probably 6'5 or 6'6 six, six when he started, which is a pretty big guy, right? And and good for, to be a wrestler. But those guys had no concept that he was going to be the giant that he was. So And, and also wrestling was booked differently at that time. There was, uh, in, in America, they were starting to get... Uh, gimmicks by the 50s you know with gorgeous george and, and freddie blassie and some of these guys but um over there in europe it was still uh a, a, yeah not too many gimmicks you were just a guy with a name and uh, it was more of a sports style uh wrestling matches competing against each other so nobody uh taught andre how to uh, wrestle like a giant they they taught him the same as all the other guys uh uh, holds, submission holds, transition moves, uh, all the running the ropes and all the stuff that you never see Andre do once he's a big WWF star. But, uh, in the, but in these early days, they trained him how to, how to be an actual uh, scientific wrestler kind of thing. And that match that you were talking about against Boynton, like you see some of that, he's doing snap mares, he's doing headlock takeovers, he's doing leapfrogs. He does a goddamn flying head scissors in that match. And like, if you've ever seen Andre do a flying head scissors, it's awesome because uh, he just never thought that he would would have ever worked that style. But in fact, he did for probably the first 10 years of his career. And this was all prior to uh, Andre knowing about the problem that he would have. Uh, uh, I don't want to call it a disease necessarily, but a... Uh, Something that's known as acromagaly or cramagaly? Acromagaly. Yeah. Acromagaly, thank yeah. you. Um, so this was something that he found out a little bit later in his career. And I think they allude to the fact that uh, had it been found a little bit earlier that maybe he wouldn't have had as many complications as he did. I believe 
the Big Show, Paul White, is also mentioned in this book as somebody who had the same thing, but it was caught sooner in the Big Show. He was able to get a surgery which prevented him from growing to the extreme amounts that Andre would inevitably would become as well too. So uh, an interesting fact there that it just it wasn't something that was well known at the time. It wasn't something that could get caught too easily. So there wasn't really a whole lot they could do for the guy. I, I almost I often wonder what would have become of him if he would have caught it early enough that he would have been able to uh, you know stop at a certain point and maybe just stick to that grappling style, be known as that big tall guy that could have gone many more years inside that professional wrestling ring as well too. Yeah, and as uh, Laprade and Ebert say in the book too, is uh, once he found out he did have it, I can't remember what age he was, but it, it, it was entirely treatable, but. Andre didn't want to get that surgery because he knew that it was his condition that made him special in, in the wrestling world and in the world. That's what made him the attraction. And he was afraid that that surgery would change that. And he didn't want that change. So even after he had the chance to get it, he decided against it because, yeah, he had this condition that is a, eventually a debilitating disease. But he knew that's what made him unique, and and he didn't want it. He didn't want anything to change. Yeah. So this would inevitably lead to the uh, the birth of what would be known as the giant Jean F- Fer John Ferrer John Ferre yeah. Ferre. Okay, thank you, Bob Smokes. You're a lot better at these pronunciations than I ever will be. Yeah. But uh, this was the first name that I guess Andre was dubbed working in uh, France and inevitably came over to work in Canada. This was the one that really got me. I did not really know about uh, the success of Andre working in Montreal. I knew about him being friends with a lot of different Canadian wrestlers and stuff like that that they talk about in this book, but did not know about his work in Montreal and how big of a territory Montreal was considered back in the 1970s and and, and in that time. Uh, Let's uh, elaborate a little bit more on that if we could... For sure. The the guys in uh, Montreal had heard about this big guy working in France. And, and of course, Quebec and Montreal people in speaking French have that tie with France. So they, uh, in contact with some of the promoters over there, had found out about the Jean Ferré, who was had kind of a lumberjack thing going on. That Jean, Jean Ferré means Iron John in, in uh, English. And it's so that's like a I think it's an old French character that's a lumberjack. They had that thing going for Andre, and then uh, they knew he could draw big in Montreal, especially in a French-speaking market where he would could do his promos in French. So they brought him over, and Andre fell in love with the city of Montreal, as as we all know. The Montreal is the is North America's European city. It's very much modeled after a, after French cities and, and stuff like that, and they speak a lot of French there. So that was a place Andre could come over and feel comfortable where he he didn't speak English so good, and as we know, he never really did speak it all that great, or he had the strong accent at the very least, but uh, he felt comfortable there, and the, and the promoters were making a lot of money off of him, and uh, the fans loved him, so pretty soon he stopped making trips and, and bought a place in Montreal and started living there and working full time uh, uh, between the two promotions there uh, run by the Vachons and the Rougeau brothers. So uh, yeah, the uh, he's from France, but Montreal was his second home uh, in North America. Yeah, he did a lot of work there uh, and bringing over a lot of what he had learned from his mentor, Frank Valois, uh, again, pronunciation pops. Yeah, Valois. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Yeah. Anyway, uh, a lot that he had learned over there that he brought over to him in Montreal as well, too, and became very good friends with a lot of the guys. I remember one part of the book, and I can't rem- na- uh, remember the name of the uh, wrestler who was scheduled to wrestle Andre, who had heard about him, but had never actually seen him in person. And when he took a little quick peek around the curtain to see what Andre looked like, it was, I think they describe it as a kind of a holy shit moment in the back of this guy's mind, is he's going to step into the ring with this guy who not only is tall, strong but is extremely capable of handling himself inside that ring uh it was it it was a great interesting part of the book and then it also would go on a lot about uh uh, as i'm going to get at here is just the uh 
just the great matches that Andre would have and how protected he was too. Here's the thing that we don't see in wrestling a lot today. A lot of guys want to see matches end in a, a clean win or, you know, a, a definite finish. And Andre was so very well protected, not only in Montreal, but in a lot of the territories that he worked where if he did suffer a loss, it wasn't usually a clean pinfall. It was usually in a multi-man match of some sort or by count out disqualification. Those are the only ways that Andre used to take losses usually back in the day because this is somebody that they knew was going to be a star. They didn't want to have him uh, jobbing out to just anybody out there in the ring. And as a result, yeah, Andre a lot of the times found himself on the winning side of matches or that finding himself getting DQ'd or counted out in order to be able to put his opponents over. And and one of the problems for uh, promoters at that time was to keep finding uh, fresh opponents for him. Um, sometimes he would have to fight two or three guys at a time, but if they could get a big dude and bring him in, that would be a, a big money main event for their promotion. And uh, in the early 70s, the, the big feud in wrestling was Andre the Giant versus Don Leo Jonathan. And if you know anything about Don Leo Jonathan, he was a giant of sorts uh, back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, uh, a Mormon giant, he had the big uh, sideburns and such, but he was... 6'8 or 6'9 and, and nearly 300 pounds, a pretty big dude, also very light on his feet. Uh, he was the first guy I've seen to do a, a kip up at that size, you know, a, a Chinese push up as they call it, where you go on your back and flip up onto your feet like Shawn Michaels uh, made popular. Uh, this Don Leo Jonathan was a great uh, big man performer and he got lots and lots of uh, good matches out of Andre and they toured all around, but uh, uh, in Montreal in the early 70s, boy, that was a hot, hot ticket. And he also uh, spent time in England as well, too. Another big guy we talk about him going up against. Uh, took on a guy named Big Bruno uh, Elrington over in the UK. Uh, Elrington was actually billed at six foot five. 280 pounds while they were billing Andre at being six foot ten at the time. So again, we were talking about a guy who was a little bit more on par size wise and physical size with Andre, uh, able to get some great matches out of him there too. And also while in the UK, did a lot of matches against uh, Tony St. Clair was the name of another guy that he got in there and did a lot of grappling with as well too, Pop Smokes. Yeah, yeah. And, and in the late 60s and early 70s, Andre had already become such a uh, such a prize to have on your card that he was doing lots of international dates too. He, he was doing South Africa, Algeria and Morocco and Tunisia in Northern Africa, the places you never think about when you think of professional wrestling, but they had, uh, they had their feds and they had their cards too. And, and everybody wanted Andre because you get him. And even, even back at that time, he was a spectacle and he was part of that, uh, Part of that exciting part of wrestling where you just get to see someone that you could never see in your normal life walking around on the street like a, an actual giant. And it's interesting you bring up South Africa too because I'm looking at a note here about his time that he was wrestling under his legitimate name, Andre Rusmov, uh, representing Bulgaria down in South Africa. And that would have been uh, doing legitimate grappling, <clears throat> uh, Greco-Roman style. Uh, maybe for some of the rest, uh, listeners who may be not familiar, we say Greco-Roman as if you all know definitely what Greco-Roman wrestling is. Now, Greco-Roman wrestling is another form of Olympic-style wrestling, mat-to-mat wrestling that you'll see. Um, Greco-Roman is just a different way of doing it, a different stance that you start in uh, when you start off your matches and stuff like that. A little bit more, I'd say, physical. Uh, I, I don't know, I want to say physical up front and stuff like that in your stance and positioning it's not immediately about leg shoots and stuff like that you, you'll see necessarily in uh, olympic wrestling it's a lot more uh, upper body and stuff like that when it comes to the greco-roman style i think uh, you can maybe back me up a little bit on that one pop smokes yeah greco-roman was the original style of wrestling used in the olympics but hence the name back from ancient greece and ancient rome but of course, styles change uh, over the years, so it branched out and in, in, into being freestyle, which was it was called eventually after a while. And I, I'm not even sure about today uh, if they still call it freestyle wrestling. I think it's just called Olympic or amateur wrestling. But uh, yeah, yeah, that uh, it changed over time, and then so did the name. So. 
Yeah, so from there, I mean, uh, Andre went on to a lot of other great things as well, too. I'm just looking through some of my notes because there's so much to talk about. Um, he, would, he would inevitably in 1968 be uh, paired up in the ring against a couple of guys from Japan as well, too. Uh, this would be where he kind of got to meet strong Kobayashi and a lot of history there uh, that led him to... Uh, Japan pro wrestling and working over in the Japanese style. I don't know if a lot of people listening are familiar with Andre working over in Japan, but he had a great career working in Japan, very famous over there. Uh, often billed as even Monster Rusimov when he was doing his Japanese tours uh, for various companies. And I want to say that he worked uh, not only for uh, the, for the company I just mentioned, but also I believe he did make appearances for New Japan eventually and... Uh, Pretty sure there was another one in there I'm missing as well, two pop smokes that you might be able to fill in. But yeah, uh, lots that uh, will inevitably come out about Andre and his time in Japan, but a lot of great matches that he had there, uh, a lot of great feuds that he had there as well too. And uh, very well respected a lot by the guys who worked over in Japan. He was always looking out for those guys. Yeah, and uh, it came about that he had so many good matches in, in Quebec and Montreal that he started to get used up a little bit. His gates weren't as big and all that. So the Vachon brothers knew that they they had to let him go out into the world and let him uh, have matches elsewhere to get his reputation going and to, to keep him fresh for their fans. So by the early 70s, uh, Giant Baba had started New Japan Pro Wrestling and Antonio Inoki was his competitor, had started All Japan Pro Wrestling. Um... New Japan and Giant Baba worked with the NWA and Inoki and All Japan worked with Vince McMahon Sr. in the WWF. So uh, Andre had ties to both those leagues and worked for both. But um, I think he preferred uh, Giant Baba. And they also had some matches. Baba being, uh, uh, I think he might have also had Acromegaly and uh, was not nearly as big as Andre, was quite tall, but it was skinny and a little bit of an awkward body, but everybody loved Baba in Japan, and he had huge matches. He was the biggest promoter. He was also tied with the Yakuza, too, which uh, didn't help his, or didn't hurt his money holdings at all, and uh, that was a company that uh, none of the boys dared to try and fuck over because uh, they had the Yakuza behind them, but... Uh, at any rate, uh, Andre worked for both companies, uh, both uh, through Vince McMahon Sr. and New Japan, and then uh, uh, with Baba in the other league. And uh, yeah, he worked as a heel there. They called him uh, Monster Rusimov to kind of uh, build on the Godzilla movies, which were starting out. So they wanted a they wanted a giant monster in their thing. They called him Monster Rusimov and. I like a lot of his Japan work because it's different than his North American work. It, it, he didn't have the same uh, protection in Japan and they could do different things with him because it's not like now with the internet. You, if, if you did stuff, it matches in another country, the fans back home weren't going to see it and weren't going to know what happened and didn't know if you took losses or anything like that. They only knew whatever the magazines reported so they could use him as a heel. They had uh, lots of their guys went competitively with Andre instead of getting squashed by him all the time. You mentioned Strong uh, Kobayashi and also uh, um, there were a few other guys. And he had matches against American guys too. His matches against Stan Hansen in, in Japan are, are legendary. That he would, And that's where Andre would let guys do stuff on him too. Uh, Hansen got all the body slams he wanted on Andre and back body drops and kicking him in the head when he's down and all that stuff. Andre loved working over there because he could do uh, the stuff that he wanted to do and, and wasn't tied down by the promoters. So I want to touch back a little bit on the Montreal thing as I've coming across a few more notes uh, uh, mentioning about uh, working for the Vachons, uh, Maurice Vachon in particular, and mm -hmm. uh, being over there, working with them. Uh the great stuff there, and also that uh, this was around, just pushing around the 1970s, and I 
I came across one of the pictures in the book here that reminded me I wanted to bring this up because, again, a lot of the uh, younger people listening to the show right now might not know this. Uh, there is a picture here. Andre the Giant, one of the moves that he was using back in the 1970s, might be familiar to some as known as the Tombstone Pile Driver. A comment in the book made, made about how the Undertaker himself, the dead man, wasn't quite the dead man. In fact, he was just a young boy watching from the sidelines at this point. Andre the Giant using that move long before it was popularized by uh, the Undertaker, Mark Calloway. Yeah, that's a perfect move for a, a large man to, to use because if your opponent's not as tall as you, then you can use that uh tombstone front pile driver it looks so impressive because you got the guy turned upside down and he's he's uh he's completely uh helpless to your move and uh yeah the other thing about uh his time in montreal too is that he was working for the vachon's promotion but there was a promotional war going on in in montreal and that always complicates things it can make for some good business for both sides, but the Rougeau brothers had the other half of Montreal and they weren't happy about not having Andre. I think he did do some shows for them, but it was always the battle and, and when there's a when there's a war over money like that, you know there's gonna be some underhanded tactics and that was part of the thing that started to edge Andre out of that area. He had bought into the Vachon brothers uh, Montreal booking office so that he was a part owner of the company and then uh, he started getting some bad vibes and some criticisms from other wrestlers, most notably uh, Edward Carpentier and also uh, Dino Bravo. There was some professional jealousy going on. The guys didn't like him always having the top spot. It made the main event harder to get into and one of the spots was always taken by Andre. So. He was hurt by some of the professional jealousy and uh, that that all started to add up to when he was going to leave Montreal and start going out on his own. And, and that's the Vachons had also been working with Vince McMahon Sr. So they got him booked for WWWF and now you're in the big money league. And when Vince Sr. saw what he had with Andre, he wanted to lock him in and with the big paydays and the big money and the big contract, he could book him in and lock him into his company. So what he did was eventually Vince McMahon Sr. Uh, took over Andre the Giant's booking rights. And now anyone in North America that wanted to book Andre had to do it through Vince Sr. So you would call up Vince Sr. if you wanted Andre for a weekend or for a show. He would say, okay, well, I've got a date in, I've got a couple weekends in June and one in August, uh, which, you know, if you pay me, you have to pay him, but you have to pay me too to get this booking. And that's, that's how uh, Andre worked his stuff. It was all through McMahon Sr. And McMahon Sr. was genius in doing this at the time. <clears throat> Great business oh, yeah. deal for him. I mean, this was a star in the making and probably also uh, played a little bit into the film career of Andre the Giant too. Uh, there was an early French film that Andre was a part of that I am not even going to begin to try to pronounce the name. You guys can look it up, read the book, whatever you want. But let's talk a little bit more about Andre's movie career before we even talk about the stuff with uh, Vince Senior and working into the um, what people know of Andre the Giant more. So um, his early career, and I mean, you're wearing the most appropriate shirt you could be possibly right now, Pop Smokes with Conan the Barbarian on it, but one thing people might not know about Andre the Giant was his appearance in Conan the Destroyer, where he was on set there with uh, basketball player Wilt Chamberlain and also with notorious actor Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, he plays a monster in this particular film. Uh, not well known, I believe he wasn't credited or he was credited under a name that or under his legit name so nobody actually knew that this was uh the giant jean ferret that uh was talking about in there and he was in so much makeup and everything like that that it was really difficult to tell that he was in this particular picture but it kind of started andre into the world of the entertainment side that he kind of enjoyed and really wanted to get into and inevitably would lead to his role in The Princess Bride, directed by Rob Reiner. And what a lot of great stories this book has, in particular about that. The people that he worked with, uh, becoming really good friends with actress Robin Wright on set as well, too. And uh, there's a there's a 
particular part of the book that made me really chuckle when I read about it because it just goes to show the uh, the humor of Andre the Giant. And I've I've heard all about this in the HBO documentary about Andre as well too. Is just about the legendary gas that this guy would pass and stuff like that, and how comical yeah. it was. And a particular story they tell in this book is about on the set of The Princess Bride when Andre let one good big ripper out and everybody on set started laughing. And director Rob Reiner actually started getting upset with the cast thinking that laughing about this would actually hurt Andre's feelings or something like that. And Andre turned around to him, no boss, my farts are funny. <laughs> everybody should be laughing. And I'm telling you, I don't often laugh when reading a book, Papa Smokes, because it's hard to get the chuckles out of the context that you're reading. But in this one, you could just picture it. You could picture Andre having a good chuckle about this with the cast and stuff like that. He just seemed like the kind of guy that enjoyed his ribs. He'd enjoy having fun like that and just a great guy to be around in general. For sure. And you talk about him getting into uh, the movie business as well. It Previous to those ones that you mentioned, uh, I remember being so excited as a little wee kid, and I'm talking under eight years old or something, there was an old TV show that you'll remember the title of, whether you saw or not, it was called The Six Million Dollar Man, yep. and it was uh, Lee Majors playing the uh, the bionic man who was part machine and part man and, and had various adventures. Well, he had an episode where he battled a Sasquatch or a Bigfoot, as they called it, and and Andre the Giant played Bigfoot in the suit. And they, uh, the Bionic Man has a fight. Uh, the Bionic Man, whose name is Steve Austin, by the way, yeah. if you want another little wrestling <laughs> crossover. But uh, they have a fight, and uh, Austin goes goes totally Beowulf on the on the Bigfoot and rips his arm off, and the Bigfoot takes off having lost this battle and, and and dies in the in the cave somewhere but it it was it was in the entertainment magazines way back then and we, my brother and I remember were just aghast oh my god that's Andre the Giant that's the wrestler that's so excellent but I guess Andre in real life was friends with the the lead actor Lee Majors so he was also on Lee Majors' next show which was called The Fall Guy which was about uh, a stunt man that solved mysteries and stuff and did stunts uh, along the way. And Andre was always good friends with the actor Lee Major, so he was on a couple of those. Those were network TV shows at the time. It's very, uh, very good crossover material for a pro wrestler at that time. I think there had been a few wrestlers in movies before that, such as uh, Abdullah the Butcher was in some what, Sonny Chiba kung fu movies, and Terry Funk had been in a couple of movies, but the Andre was the first wrestler to cross over into pop culture in a big way, into uh, TV shows and movies that were widely consumed by the public. So that that's an interesting little area. Yeah, and uh, going back to a little bit of The Princess Bride too, there's a lot of comments made about his uh, legendary drinking and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. A couple of times that Rob Reiner would mention about Andre packing down an entire case, and I'm not talking a case of beer, I'm talking a case of wine. We're talking yeah. 12 bottles of wine on set and having Rob Reiner having to go and try to direct Andre the Giant, who's barely able to stand, fall on his ass and getting him to say his lines correctly, when he already is not the most clear-speaking individual to begin with. Now you've got a drunk giant on your hands trying to say these lines. I believe the final line in the film where Andre said, does anybody have a peanut, was one of the most difficult parts for them to get out of him because he was a minimum of 12 bottles of wine and probably a good case or two of beer into his day when they shot that particular scene. I, I don't want to touch too much on Andre's drinking or anything like that. It's notorious. We all know that the guy could put down a lot of booze, but it's also very sad and very laid out in this book about why he went that direction. It was the pain and everything from the wrestling ring and, you know, the sadness he felt from being so separated from normal society that led him to that kind of drinking. It wasn't just drinking because he he liked to drink and have fun with boys, which he did do, and that's fine as well, too. But a lot of it did stem from a darker place in Andre's uh, personal life as well, too. And I don't really want to touch on that so much. I'd like to show the... Uh, the love for Andre and what he did do uh, that was good and stuff. So I just, I wanted to bring it up because it is a little bit funny and stuff like that. But uh, as we're talking about the film career anyway of Andre the Giant, the entertainment side. Uh, from there, I do want to uh, start talking a little bit more about though 
his deal with Vince McMahon Sr. and what inevitably led him to the career he would have with the WWF. Uh, and I, I, initially at the time, the WWWF, which not a lot of you know unless you've checked out our podcast before, the World Wide Wrestling Federation, which was started by Vince McMahon Sr. Uh, prior to selling it to his son, the Vince McMahon that people know today currently with the WWE. Uh, so this deal was, yeah, like you mentioned before, Papa Smoke's an excellent deal, not only for um, for Andre, but also for Vince Sr. Because, I mean, everybody at this time was wanted to book Andre the Giant. Uh, the cut was going to Vince uh, Sr. And he also had for say as well, too. So if he had any reason to have Andre the Giant booked on a sh- uh, program or he was going to need him for particular dates, this guy was wrapped up, locked up. This is the, his guy that he had. He was willing to share him around, but definitely was making quite a lot of money even when Andre wasn't working for him. Yeah, yeah, and and you got to remember that Vince Senior also couldn't didn't want Andre all the time. Like the, it's a different business than now. They you didn't lock a guy down because the fans would get tired of him. Even a even a special draw like Andre, the, you could overuse him and the fans would get tired of him. So. It worked to McMahon's favor as well to book him out around other areas of the country. Um, If you want some good uh, Andre stories told by somebody that know him, I I heard some good ones on uh, Ron Fuller's podcast, uh, the Tennessee Stud cast. Uh, Ron Fuller had been a promoter in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, and had uh, Southeastern Wrestling, it was called, and he had a working relationship with McMahon Sr. as well, so he used to call him each year, get a couple dates on Andre, maybe a, maybe a Friday and a Sunday show or something like that. And uh, he talked about having Andre in as a special uh, attraction and, uh, and the, the care and work he put into making sure that Andre was happy and comfortable in his company. He said he would go to uh, uh, the hotel and say, Hey, guys... I've got Andre coming in. He doesn't fit on a normal bed. Can you get some guys to to uh, nail two beds together? We're also going to need, you got to have the kitchen open for him all the time and a couple cooks there because he loves to eat and he's going to eat a lot. He'll order the whole menu. So you got to have that. I'll, I'll pay extra for it. Just have these guys there all night. He's got to have his booze get stocked up on a whole bunch of booze. We got to have a big car to drive him around in or a big van. We'll take the seats out of the van so he can sit in the back. And this is what guys would do. And Andre always very appreciative of Ron Fuller and, and I'm sure other promoters that went to these lengths too, but he made lifelong friends out of stuff like that. And, and Andre was a guy who appreciated that and, and who took it in, into consideration when he took his bookings to just oh yeah, okay, this guy understands me and he will take the extra effort to make sure I'm comfortable so I'm going to have a good time here. Andre was telling Ron Fuller, uh, uh, as Ron told it on his podcast, I'll just stay here in Tennessee. I love it here, Ron. Like, can I just stay here with you? And Well, you know, that's not how it works, Andre. But yeah, I know, but I would stay here because you take care of me and I'm comfortable here. So there's some great stories on the stud cast if you ever listen to that too. And also some great stories that came out of the book about not only did guys accommodate Andre and stuff like that throughout his career, like you said, about making sure he had the right sleeping accommodations, drink, food, everything accompanied to him. But Andre looked after the people that he cared most about. There's a story in there about him purchasing a farm for a good friend of his and stuff like that, basically allowing them to have a place to stay. Andre didn't seem like the kind of guy who, despite the fact the kind of money that he was making and the time that he was making it, the amount of money that he had on hand, he was never the guy that had to flaunt it in a ridiculous way. He didn't have to have fancy things. He just wanted to have the boys there. He wanted to be able to sit down, have a good meal, have a good drink, make sure everybody else was happy around him kind of thing. Andre was a people pleaser by the sounds of it to me. Uh, every Everybody that he looked out for was always well taken care of. He was buying drinks. He was buying food. He was giving them places to stay. Andre didn't necessarily need the money for himself. He wanted to go out there work. He wanted to entertain and he wanted to make sure that he had a lot of friends around him to always have a good time. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Andre was, yeah, he was a person that enjoyed good food and good drink. Of course, he's traveling around the world all the time, eating at all kinds of fancy restaurants and stuff. So he became a gourmet and, a and, a. a 
a wine connoisseur and all that stuff. He liked the company of beautiful women and, and a lot of women were very curious about him and uh, he never was short on having a date kicking around, but he traveled so much that he could never really, I, I think it sounds from uh, the book that we reviewed that he would have liked to have maybe settled down at some point with one person, but he just traveled too much. So he was drawn to uh, people that were in the same position as him that, that worked in show business and traveled all the time. A lot of those people are lonely and they're, they're looking for, uh, you know, moments where you can connect with someone. So they talk uh, at length about uh, Andre had gotten with a, a lady who worked with the, the circus. She was a contortionist, which might come in quite in handy if you're going to get <laughs> physical with Andre the Giant, I suppose. You might have to be a contortionist, but I'm just joking about this. But anyway, this is what happened. And uh, she ended up uh, giving birth uh, from from after her uh, rendezvous with Andre and had a daughter and uh, they talk about this at length in the book it was it was a joy for Andre but it was also a pain too because he knew he couldn't give his daughter what she probably wanted was uh, and needed was a, a dad that stayed home and helped with the parenting that just wasn't Andre there there was nothing he could really do about that aside from help out financially and also uh, the girl's mother just didn't didn't want that situation. We just wanted to raise her daughter by herself and, and didn't want the complicated issue of having a father that's there one day out of two years and then isn't there for the rest of it and all that. But Andre was uh, felt felt cl uh, close to his daughter uh, emotionally and, and uh, he always wanted life to be good for her. And uh, it, it's kind of a sad part of the story, but he wanted to be part of her life, but it just... It wasn't to be with the situation the way it was. Yeah, and uh, it's one of the tragedies of somebody who does travel like that and being able to have a family and stuff like that. It's very unfortunate that that's the way it was for him. But, you know, you know, at the heart of it, it seemed like he wanted to be able to do the right thing, but he was so far deep into it. Uh, before we start touching on the inevitable WWF and Vince Jr. stuff here, um, I wanted to harken back to the... Uh, pro wrestling versus boxing night that was brought up in this book in particular. We're talking about a crossover between uh, New J uh, not New Japan, but all this would have been all Japan pro wrestling, I believe, at the time, and uh, the boxing world. And Andre would have had a uh, match that night. Although critically, this is considered a low point for you know the wrestlers that were involved, and also for the boxers that were involved, because this crossover just did not work. Um, believe I, I can't remember what boxer it was now that uh, uh, Chuck Andre. Wepner I, I do believe yeah that's who Andre took on because at the top of the card I think initially they wanted him to fight Muhammad Ali but in the end it was Ali was going in the main event and again you're going to have to help me out Bob Smokes because I'm drawing a blank and uh, I forgot my notes Antonio Inoki there we go Antonio yeah. Inoki so yeah and this uh, if you go back and look at any of the reports from this night this did not work <laughs> whatsoever yeah yeah it was it was a it was an interesting prospect on paper but uh, in the ring it just wasn't going to work out Andre's match against Wepner wasn't horrible but it wasn't great either and I don't think it uh it was I'm not sure how it drew but I don't think it was going to draw again sort of thing so it was a failed experiment and and just as a point of interest when Inoki fought Ali they did it as kind of a shoot like I, I think they might have had something worked out for the for the finish but they fought it as kind of a shoot so Inoki wasn't going to stand up and punch with with Ali so he laid on the mat and, and did leg kicks on Ali some some pretty darn hard ones and it's thought that that actually might have shortened Muhammad Ali's career some of those uh, vicious kicks that Inoki uh, delivered to his to his legs uh, during that match and it turned out to be a boring match. Inoki didn't want to lose, so he wasn't going to stand up with Ali, and Ali wasn't going to get down and wrestle with Inoki. So you had this stalemate match, kind of, plus the heavyweight boxing champ ends up getting injured out of it, and Inoki doesn't, you know, might have drawn money for that show, but like I say, it wasn't going to be sustained in the future for, for more 
boxer versus wrestler shows. So yeah, like you say, ultimately a disappointment. And before I was a wrestling fan, I was actually quite familiar with this particular night in general because, I mean, the old saying goes, my father was a boxer, his father was a boxer, so on, so on. This is uh, true stuff about good old Bobby here. But um, growing up in my household, Muhammad Ali was a staple. He was uh, somebody that we looked upon uh, when it came down to watching our boxing. So we were very familiar with his fight with Anoki and about what it could have done to his career. We're getting a little off topic from Andre here, but I just wanted to mention that, uh, you know, Ali did a lot of things that I think could have shortened his career, including uh, working with George Foreman, where he just basically laid on the ropes, allowing Foreman to punch him in the face for 12 rounds. Yeah. Steady kind of thing. Um, yeah, Ali did some crazy stuff, and that was shown there. And, yeah, I could imagine that, uh, that everything that he did with Anoki only just added to that shortened career that he ended up having. I think, uh, you know, it might have been mentioned that Putting Ali in with Andre the Giant at the time wouldn't have been the best for either one of these guys because Muhammad Ali is over as he was with the North American crowd and Andre as big as he was. It really, what direction do you go for either guy without making the other one look bad in return kind of thing? Yeah, who, so, who's going to lose a match like that? That's a booker's nightmare. Yeah, so I think that's where that one ended up too. So it's, uh, it's definitely interesting crossing over into the boxing world, but again, not something that... It worked out then, and it's never worked out since. I mean, we could get into a whole brawl for all conversation here right now, but I don't think that's what we're going to get into here on Ring Respect. We'll make that for another time down the road. Uh, but anyways, uh, moving on from there, I think uh, it's about time that we start talking about uh, Vince Jr. and the WWF. So inevitably, the WWF, the Worldwide Wrestling Federation, was sold to Vince Jr., I believe, for a very minimal, minimal amount by his father. Uh, Vince Sr., and it was said that he would uh, keep things the same. Nothing was going to change. It would remain territories the way they were, handshake agreements amongst promoters and all this kind of thing. Uh, we know the same old story has been told. Vince didn't listen to what his father told him. He went around crushing competition, buying guys up, yada, yada, yada. He started buying up all these contracts, and then he wanted the best of the best. And one of the guys that he bought the contract of was a lifelong, well, I shouldn't say lifelong friend, but he good friend of Andre the Giant, someone who was working for the AWA and someone who you would have saw in the early stages of his career and one Hulk Hogan who would inevitably become probably the most notorious feud that Andre would end up having, especially in his run with the WWF in particular. Uh, this is the one I probably most fondly knew Andre for. Uh, growing up a fan of WWF uh, back then and going back and watching WrestleMania 3 and the slam heard around the world thinking that Oh man, this is the only guy who's ever slammed Andre the Giant. Well, I mean, that could be said. The only guy that ever slammed him on a WWF pay-per-view or a wrestling show. But uh, let's talk about it for a minute. There are many guys had slammed Andre the Giant prior to Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania 3, including Hulk Hogan himself. Uh, Kamala was another one. And also uh, Harley Race, in fact, mentioned in the book as being somebody who had slammed Andre the Giant all prior to that matchup in 1983. Yeah, like... In truth, almost everybody that wrestled him slammed him at some point, or it, anyone that could muster up the strength to do it. Andre would obviously give you a hand with that as well. Also, in these early days, he wasn't as big as he was in uh, 87 for WrestleMania 3. But, um, yeah, yeah. And that, that WrestleMania 3 match was also uh, hyped up to be their first ever meeting too, which was absolutely laughable because they had toured whole years and whole summers battling each other not only in the for the Vachons and the Montreal promotion but Vince Senior had had uh, uh, Hulk Hogan as well I'm trying to think of what his name used to be he was a heel a hairy chested heel with uh, Freddie Blassie as his manager Would and this uh, be back in the Terry the Boulder Bolea days yeah maybe <laughs> yeah. Uh, he might have been yeah yeah and uh so they had, yeah, they had literally toured for whole summers together doing that match, and it was big money. Like, it, it, no, no doubt about it. Uh, that even though it wasn't a WrestleMania match, they they drew massive amounts of money because, I think by this time, even like now that we're talking about the late eighties, we're starting to get into the final third or quarter of Andre's career a lot of people didn't know about him until he was almost done which is true with a lot of wrestlers these days if they go to uh, the big leagues in the in New York but uh, yeah the, uh, he had all 
Andre kind of knew in the back of his mind that he was going to have to pass the torch at some point <clears throat> to a to a big physically dominant uh, wrestler that would take his place on all these cards and take his place in the wrestling world. And he worked well with Hulk Hogan. Hogan worked well with him. Hogan was scared of him, of course, as we found out from this book, as many of his opponents were. You were never sure if Andre was going to work with you or not. But these guys had a had a, a beneficial relationship. And uh, that was the great thing that when it came around to uh, Vince McMahon was needing, uh, Vince Jr., of course, was needing a big match for WrestleMania three. He was having some problems with some bookings and stuff like that, and he needed a big match. And so he looked to the past, he looked to what his dad has, had done, and he thought, yeah, we, maybe we could do this one. And I think uh, from what we learned in, in this book is that Andre wasn't even all that crazy about doing it. He didn't want to do the big matches anymore, and he didn't want to uh, work with the huge guys because he was, uh, even by 85, 86, he was starting to get sore, get broken down. His back was bad, his hip was bad. He had broken his leg getting out of bed that one day, but of course Vince spun that as an angle and, and said that uh, the wrestler Killer Khan had broken his leg. So that that led into a nice feud for them, a return feud uh, where uh, I always was fascinated by that in the magazines bef in, when I was a little kid before the internet, the pictures of Andre finally gets his hands on Killer Khan. He, he splashes him a whole bunch of times and... and Khan's injured going out on the stretcher, the old army style stretcher where the two guys carry it and uh, Andre attacks the the stretcher in the in the aisle going back to the dressing room and is hitting killer the, an already injured killer Khan with the stretcher and people just hadn't seen this side of Andre before. He was still working as a baby face of course, but they they wanted the sense of rage and revenge to be uh, out there and this was just unheard of to us the way we knew Andre as a kid. He was always such a nice giant and everything. It was wild. It was well done. And this is what they wanted to get going with Hogan too, was that uh, they'd never settled anything. And, and the, the two big guys, there was only room for one big guy. And that hence the big build up to uh, WrestleMania three, which they started on uh, segments on Piper's pit on WWE programming and had Andre coming in and out, also working in North America as a heel for the first time. Very interesting. Hadn't done that before. Brought him out with Bobby Heenan and, and some of the baby face wrestlers going, what are you doing, Andre, hanging around with that guy? Don't be hanging around with that guy. He, he's no good for you. you know, they presented Andre as a frustrated uh, wrestler that he wanted the gold. He finally wanted the title and it was a compelling angle and it worked. It was believable that Andre had become tired of being the friendly giant all the time. And, uh, man, the, the build up to this match, uh, was, was very, very skillfully done by McMahon and company. And, uh, man, they built it up. We, that's still probably one of their most iconic matches the company's ever had. Yeah. And, and highly criticized for the actual execution of the match. <clears throat> I, I went back after we read this book and we went and watched some Andre stuff. I did go back and watch this particular WrestleMania three match. And while it's not got any sort of like great wrestling behind it or anything, like you said, the skillfulness of the way this thing was built and the way it ended up getting executed was enough to make it a main event worthy matchup. I mean, the name of the two guys involved, first of all, was big enough, especially at that time to sell just about anything. And this was so well put together that it didn't matter that this match wasn't full of a lot of crazy moves. This wasn't, you know, uh, Ricky Steamboat versus Macho Man Randy Savage like people saw earlier in the night on the card. I mean, this was never going to be the pure wrestling match or anything like that. And you almost have to take a step back and take a look at it for the spectacle as opposed to the wrestling. Uh, this thing was a spectacle. It was sold as a spectacle. And it's why... Even to this day, WWF or WWE, my apologies now, uh, still talk so highly about this. And it's one of the moments they always show. Whenever you see the opening credits to a WWE show nowadays, the first image that gets shown is Hulk Hogan slamming Andre the Giant. Because it is notoriously probably the biggest moment in the WWF's history. Yeah, yeah. And, and worthy to note too that 
like we were saying, Andre was starting to, he, it's not like he was getting older, but he, his body was still growing as he wasn't able to, uh, his organs weren't able to, uh, uh, you know, maintain his body at its size the way that they should have been. He was, uh, he was bumping and, and had injuries from in the ring and stuff. And when Vince Jr. first approached Andre about doing this match, Andre said no. He said he didn't want to do it. But he had had that relationship with Vince Sr. He had a good relationship with Vince Jr. And Vince Jr. said, man, I need you. Like, I've spent so much money that I didn't have on these first two WrestleManias that if I don't get this one done, like we're going out of business, like can you be loyal to me and and my dad, Vince Senior, who had passed by that time? Can you be loyal to us? Can you get this match done? And Andre said, "I, it's not even a question of wanting to. I'm not sure if I can get through a match, especially with a big guy like Hogan at this point." And right up until the whole build for that match, Andre was quiet about the whole thing, and everyone was wondering what was going to happen. And you know the WrestleMania three being held in the Detroit uh, Pontiac Silverdome, they they talk about it in the book that it was such a long walk across the whole football field that Andre wasn't sure he could walk it or it would take him so long to walk it. So they made that they made those little entrances with the little ring on top of the truck where him and Heenan could stand on there so that he could get a ride. Like that's the kind of shape he was in for that match. He wasn't sure he could make it to the ring. So, I mean, the, the fact alone that he that he agreed to participate in this, put all his pain aside and, and everything else, and, and cooperated with Hogan enough to get that match done. After that build, it, it, was, it was just solid gold money the whole way through. And, uh, I mean, Vince then was, especially Vince Jr., had always had this tie with Andre, but after that, he was he was completely indebted to him and that, that was one of the guys he was going to take care of for you know for as long as he lived kind of thing like we've talked about gorilla monsoon and pat patterson and a few guys and jerry briscoe from the past you guys did such good work for me i'm going to take care of you for the rest of your life and obviously andre at the top of that list yeah certainly was and I mean, a lot of great things that he accomplished. And talking about the guys he looked out for, I want to bring this up as well, too, because it's mentioned not only in this book, but it's been mentioned as well on the a &E biography of Brett the Hitman Hart that the Hart family was another one. Andre very fond of the Hart family, uh, how they would work, how they'd present themselves. And he loved hanging out with the Canadian boys as well, too. So he became very friendly with the uh, Hart's uh, Brett and Owen and stuff. There's some great pictures of the three of them together and stuff. And I actually went back and watched a match between Bret Hart versus Andre the Giant from the WWF. And again, you're you're talking about a very big size difference. Bret never known as being one of the big guys, although considering what we see nowadays, Bret would be a very sizable individual in the professional wrestling ring. Uh, Bret versus Andre looks like a very mismatched pairing between the two guys. And I watched this thing, and this was not bad at all by any means. I mean, Andre allowed Bret to get some good pieces of work in there and stuff like that. Uh, worked very comfortably and very safely at the same time. I mean, Brett was well taken care of in this matchup in particular. Uh, Andre got to look good coming out of it still. And at the same time, Brett did not by any means look bad coming out of it, even in a loss, because he was able to really get his stuff in there and really uh, take it to Andre the Giant. And Andre would only allow that from guys that he liked working with and that he felt right working with. And it just so happened that Bret Hart happened to be one of those guys that gave Andre one of those moments in the ring. And I think uh, had Andre been able to still go at the rate that he was able to go to in his heyday and stuff like that, I think that an Andre heyday match versus uh, in prime Bret the Hitman Hart might have been one of the greatest things that we could have seen in a wrestling ring. Far better than even what we got with Hogan and Andre at a WrestleMania 3 in terms of a pure wrestling match. That was a match that I think we were robbed of getting to see in, the, in its prime. Well, then, if you like that idea, you maybe you should go back and watch some of the old AWA, too, because they were booking Andre against the AWA champ, Nick Bockwinkle. Now, talk about a champ being in a between a rock and a hard place, having a title defense like that against Andre the Giant. But the way they laid out the match, they made it believable that Bockwinkle, the sneaky heel, but also the great tactician, was... Uh, 
you know, running out of the ring and jumping back in and using his speed against Andre, but he kept putting him in, Andre in the sleeper and Andre would be carrying him around on his back, but unable to get the grip off of his neck on the back and, and constantly down to one knee. And you're thinking, man, Bockwinkle's going to put Andre to sleep, but can you put that big giant to sleep? No, he would come back for a bit, but then back to that sleeper and knocking him down. And it's like, yeah, I guess that's the way a smaller guy would fight a big guy like that. You'd have to kick his legs and try and take that out from underneath him and then choke him out maybe, right? If you could hang on his back long enough. And I found those matches captivating as a kid. You're just thinking there's no way Bockwinkle will keep his title. But of course, they had no no intention of putting the belt on Andre as no one, no promoters ever did. What a terrible idea that would be because, first of all, he doesn't need the belt to have the status that he has. And secondly, how are you ever going to get it off of him once you have it on him? So, yeah, they uh, he worked with numerous champions. But I think that was a sadness for Andre, too, is that he never got the champion's recognition. He didn't really need it, but I think every wrestler would like to hold major belts in their career. Well, I mean, Vince Jr. found a great way of getting the belt back off Andre the Giant as yeah. after that WrestleMania three encounter, inevitably there would be the rematch. Andre the Giant would become victorious, becoming the WWF champion at the time. And he turned around immediately selling the belt to the one million dollar man, Ted DiBiase. Uh, this was then taken as a something that couldn't be done. The belt was immediately stripped from Ted DiBiase and that would lead to the inevitable tournament at WrestleMania 4 that led to the Macho Man Randy Savage becoming the WWF champion. But uh, arguably that, again, uh, harkens back to what we were talking about of Andre being protected back in the territory days, only losing in cases of DQs, uh, countouts and stuff. That was about the only logical way that I think Vince could get the belt back or back off Andre without inevitably having Hulk Hogan take it right back directly from him. And then again, that just puts the belt straight back on Hogan. And then we would have never maybe got runs with Macho Man Randy Savage and he might not have hit the heights that he hit as well too. So everything Andre did seemed to have a lot of purpose in putting over a lot of guys over time, uh, whether he liked them or not. But a lot of the things that fell into place and what Andre did for this industry inevitably led to a lot of these guys being able to do what they did and inevitably led to the professional wrestling you all watch today. You can all stem it back to these guys, these legends that we talk about, and Andre being one of those major legends of what he did for professional wrestling, both inside the ring and on the entertainment side. A guy that became very adaptable to both, I guess, what we would arguably call sports entertainment and also professional wrestling simultaneously. I mean, this man did it all. I mean, his WWF run lasted until about 1990, I believe it was. Uh, WrestleMania six, his appearance with Haku as one half of the tag team champions, Bobby Heenan, their manager, uh, losing out to Demolition that night at WrestleMania six in the Toronto Sky Dome. Again, still using those carts that you talked about that were on the trucks with the ring around them so they could drive out to the ring and everything. Uh, they actually ended up using that for most of the night at WrestleMania six there for the yeah. performers outside of, I believe, the Ultimate Warrior making about a 10 kilometer run down to the ring in his match in the main event. But again, yeah, Andre again was carted in, carted out that night, lost his title. And I believe after that is when he decided he wasn't going to work for Vince anymore. I believe he was going to try doing something outside of the WWF. And he went over to, I believe it was going to be called the UWF that was just getting started. And it was shortly after that, unfortunately, that the world lost Andre the Giant passing away due to the complications that he had. And uh, we lost a major legend that day. Yeah, yeah. And I just wanted to back up. We'll talk about his death in one second. I just wanted to back up and talk about his WWF run for a second too because after that WrestleMania 3 match and, and, and the stuff with uh, winning the title and selling it to DiBiase, he, uh, that's when everything changed for Andre with the WWF. This is when he started to get dissatisfied too because he had wanted to work with Hogan. He liked him. They did great matches. They worked well together. And Andre was smart too. He knew that he was near the end of his career so he wanted to cement his legacy and he wanted to be tied, his career to be tied with, to Hulk Hogan's because he knew Hulk Hogan was going to be an enduring legend in the sport. So he wanted to always have that tie to Hulk Hogan. 
So him doing that job at WrestleMania three was was a huge thing. It was like like we mentioned before, a passing of the torch. But then after that period, McMahon Jr. being McMahon Jr. has to take more than than he should take, and that's when he started putting. He wanted Andre to put over a whole bunch of guys, including the Ultimate Warrior. And they were going on those tours, year-long tours, where he would lose to the Ultimate Warrior in in a minute and a half every single night. Because Warrior couldn't even do a good match, couldn't even work a good match. All he could do was his his, uh, shaking of the ropes, his running clotheslines, and that was about it. And that that was like one of the major blows against Andre's career, is that now he's doing the job to a guy that isn't legit doing it every single night and took so many clean losses in that that it it destroyed his reputation to a certain extent. Um, of course, he had all the greatness from before, but now there's a whole generation of fans growing up seeing Andre, oh, you know, he loses to the Warrior every single night. And it was kind of sad, and I think that's what, uh, that's what precipitated his wanting to leave WWF is that Vince got something out of him, got what he wanted out of him, but wanted more all the time, as Vince is known to do. And if he if he thinks he can get something out of you, he'll he'll ring ring blood out of a stone until he can't get any more. And that that's what he did to Andre. I always found that sad as a young fan, knowing of Andre's greatness, and then seeing this this hairdo, uh, steroid monkey, uh, tanning bed baby oil guy going over that that can't wrestle worth shit going over andre every night it it was sad it was it was blasphemy it was it was disgusting and i just didn't like that at all that's part of my you know i i'm not fond of mcmahon or the wwe that's one of the things i was probably only a teenager or in my early 20s at that time but learning some stuff about the wrestling business and just thinking damn that's doing Andre real dirty. Like, I don't like that at all. And McMahon just wants to squeeze a buck out of everybody. And he's, by God, he's even doing it with Andre. Like, and, and this sucks. So this is like a personal observation of mine. And they talk about it, uh, Eber and Laprade in that book, as it being a sad thing. It's the most losses and most clean losses he ever took in his career. And they were just using them at that time to, uh, they wanted him to get over their, their steroid monkey next uh, next guys that they wanted to come up and yeah just a, a sad time for me well i'll have you know it might make you a little bit happier that the young uh, bobby and his wwf uh, action figures made sure that andre the giant was a multiple time wwf champion well good and uh never very often was a clean win for the ultimate warrior in the uh, books that are against andre the giant uh, back in my booking days as a young fan watching uh, but yeah, it is very sad and when you bring that up, Pop Smokes, too, and uh, looking back on it. I mean, the Ultimate Warrior was a guy who was definitely geared towards people of my age back then. Um, I, I can't say I was ever the biggest fan of him. I didn't. I can't say I hated him on any level back then, either. I mean, he was a baby face. He, was, he had that cool look and everything like that. And I, was, I wasn't privy to the knowledge of the business at the time that I have been now. And uh, so, you know, there was... A lot there to be said, um, but at the same time, I, I even back then, I don't think I would look at the Ultimate Warrior as a guy being able to cleanly beat a guy the physical size and prowess and the legendary status of an Andre the Giant. And, you know, I mean, it, it's a real shame that it came to that and a shame that that would be known as Andre's last days with the WWF and everything, too. And, that, and now we'll, we'll go back to the passing as well. I, I remember t- the day that Andre the Giant passed. I... Sitting at home, um, I unlike a lot of kids my age at the time, especially living in Saskatchewan here, I was at home watching cable television, and this was on just about every single station that I recall. I don't think you could turn to any station on the television, especially the ones coming out of the U.S., that wasn't talking about Andre the Giant's passing. And then, of course, being a fan, WWF Superstars that Saturday, a big tribute to Andre the Giant. And this inevitably led to what would become the WWF Hall of Fame. It was Andre the Giant's passing and induction being the first and only member of the WWF Hall of Fame uh, that occurred in this passing. If it weren't for him passing, I don't even know if WWF would have or had the Hall of Fame like they do or may have come along a lot later and not had the 
I guess the prestige that some think that it has and everything like that. I, it once, I guess, could be argued that it was prestigious. I mean, when you induct Andre the Giant as your first and only member into the Hall of Fame, you're talking on a very prestigious level. But unfortunately, now he's in there with a bunch of a bunch of uh, spot monkeys and joking clowns from all over the world and stuff like that. That it kind of demeans any legendary status that that Hall of Fame has. But I know the day that it happened and the day that they said that he was being inducted into this brand new Hall of Fame. I remember it so vividly. I was just a very young kid at the time. I am talking, I, I can't remember the exact year. I don't know if you have that written down. 93. 93, son of a bitch. I was 10 years old when this news hit me. And man, nothing hit me hard back then like that did. Because this was the first memory I have of a wrestler that I watched passing away. And somebody that I, like to me, didn't seem like he was old enough. To be get, be gone so soon, and uh, it was a sad time. Uh, I definitely remember it fondly in so, in certain ways uh, because it's a moment in my life I can't forget, and uh, you know cha- changed a lot of ways that I looked at professional wrestling at the time and uh, the guys that were involved with it as well too. Yeah, yeah, what a sad moment in in all of wrestling. Uh, I, I remember also and and just thinking, wow, I, uh, you know, I didn't know Andre's condition uh, at the time so much I knew that he was in his early 40s and and you know that's far too young for anybody to die and uh, but we knew that he was medically compromised in some ways he had lived a, a fast life and and, a, and a, uh, all through the wrestling business with the drinking and the bumps and all the rest of it and uh, yeah, honestly, a very, very sad moment, and, and wrestling changed after that. They they had lost their, their main guy, and how sad it was. Very much so, man. Um, so, again, that's uh, probably where I'm going to leave off with my notes about Andre the Giant. I don't know if you had anything else you want to bring up here before we wrap things up, Pop Smokes, but I'm going to put the floor over to you here. Yeah, I had... There was one quotation out of... Uh, Le Prade and Hebert's book that I wanted to read just because it it kind of encapsulated uh, a, a lot of the ideas in this book and it, it, it says here and I quote, even if this book tells the truth behind the myths one must not forget that these myths are what created Andre's legacy and although Andre died in 1993 his legacy has continued and has remained part of popular culture and that I find that quote very interesting because yeah his his career career was a lot made about myths because no one knew really how tall he was or how big he was. I mean, the McMahons build him bigger than anybody else at the seven four and four hundred ninety seven pounds or whatever. <clears throat> Le Pratt and Ebert, through uh, all their research, kind of came to the conclusion that they think that Andre was six ten. You know, like for all the things he was billed at throughout the years as a seven footer, seven four, six eight, all that stuff, they think he was six ten, and 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 the the legends of him being from the uh, the French Alps and all that that it wasn't even true. He was a farm boy and all that stuff. But uh, uh, yeah, I just like the way uh, the myths contributed to his legend, and and he was the legend in. In professional wrestling and and even if you know the truth behind the myths it it never seems to matter uh, because Andre did live up to his giant billing and another thing I wanted to say is that I I remember seeing Andre as a kid I saw him live I'd say maybe six or seven times when he passed through Winnipeg with the AWA usually for the yearly battle royal I saw him with my own eyes I saw him standing you know near me or walking out to the ring near me and I was aghast by the whole thing but you know when we were doing prep for this podcast I started thinking he's one of the biggest baby faces of all time and you know what made him so it was partly his size and and partly his strength and partly his wrestling ability but you know really what I think was so popular and what resonated with people outside the wrestling world was he had that smile you know, and you, how can you think of Andre without thinking of that big, big, genuine smile? He had it on his face when he walked to the ring. He loved the adoration of the fans. He he had that smile when he left the ring all the time. And I, and the smile came through in his t 
TV and movie work as well. Everybody loves him as Fezzik in The Princess Bride. It's such a nice movie. He's such a gentle giant in that. And for me, a big part of Andre's legacy will always be that smile. Yeah, and you know, you said the myth makes the man. And that's a lesson that a lot of you youngsters can learn. And a lot of you youngsters can have an opportunity to learn that if you want to get into the professional wrestling business. Uh, make sure that you learn all the fundamentals and learn how to keep kayfabe alive. Just because the fans think that they're smart to everything in the business nowadays doesn't mean that they have to know absolutely everything at the same time. It is okay to build yourself as heavier than what you actually are. It is okay to build yourself as taller than what you are because there is not anybody on those televisions checking exactly what your doctor has billed you at when you go for your physicals and stuff like that. And these and many other the fundamentals are what you can learn when you go to your local promotion and your local wrestling academy and learn from some of the best. And that's one of the things I want to mention before we go off the air. Prairie Pro Wrestling Academy is coming back, Papa Smokes, and it would be a real major sin if we didn't give a shout out to the Prairie Pro Wrestling Academy that we are very fond of here in Saskatoon. And know that on September 18th, I believe, is the date to sign up. We have a mini camp registered for all young hopefuls looking to get themselves into the wrestling business. And if you happen to be somebody that has the kind of physical size of an Andre the Giant, we definitely want to see you out for that kind of a thing. Uh, come learn the fundamentals. Come learn if the wrestling business is right for you. Uh, reach out to the Prairie Pro Wrestling Academy on Facebook, on Twitter, or anywhere else to find out uh, if you can find a spot to come and join us. And then join us for regular wrestling training, learning from guys in the business who have been there. They have had the opportunities. They're going to teach you the fundamentals. And you know what? You are going to learn a lot of great things and then be able to go on and travel the world just like Andre the Giant, like Bobby Eaton and all these guys. And learn from all sorts of great superstars around the world as well too. So take the opportunity to go check out the Prairie Pro Wrestling Academy. Hopefully we'll uh, get to see you there live in person coming up if you're someone local who wants to take that opportunity. Uh, Papa Smokes, I think that's all we've got today. This has been an excellent episode of Ring Respect Radio, probably one of my favorites of all time at this point in time. We got to talk about two phenomenal legends here today, and I hope that even if one person tuning in goes back and checks out the early work of Andre the Giant, checks out the book that we just reviewed, or checks out the work of Bobby Eaton, I feel like we have done our jobs here today. Uh, so anything else to add to this one before we check out? No, you put it very nicely there, Munson. Always a pleasure to be on Ring Respect Radio and talk about the legends of the past. Our most giant episode has been one of my favorites also, and the book by Bertrand E. Bear and Pat LaPrad, an awesome, awesome wrestling book and a superstar biography. Pick it up, read it. It will improve your wrestling knowledge overall. Yeah, check out your copy there today and make sure again that like and subscribe this video. Let people know about Ring Respect Radio. Uh, you can catch myself and Papa Smokes regularly on this channel for the Video Bros Network. You can catch our work on the commentary team for Prairie Pro Wrestling and hopefully we'll be back to calling some brand new matches sooner rather than later. We need to crown a champ. Looking forward to those times again, Papa Smokes. I'm very fond of sitting there being able to call the matches with you, my friend. And uh, we're just looking forward to everything in general in the future here for professional wrestling. So for myself and Papa Smokes, this is the Video Bros, and we'll see you next time. When you go to the old saloon at the Dead South End, gonna find you a man there wants to be your friend. Hey